Hello everyone, my name is Michael Levitt. I'm a professor at Stanford Medical School uh, in structural biology with an association also in computer science. And today I want to talk about protein folding, structural prediction, and biomedicine, three seemingly unrelated subjects that are actually very connected in this current world. But first, a slide on the secret of life. And basically, the secret of life is learning and self-assembly. For thousands of years, we've been looking for the secret of life. We now know it, these two things, and learning. So here is all of life in a single slide. The DNA structure contains the information. That information is coded from information into a physical object, the protein structure. The protein structure is precise to a tenth of a nanometer scale. So it's more precise than any printed circuit, probably by a factor of a thousand. That thing, structure then has a function which is based on physical interactions of, in this case, a red drug molecule and the structure. If this interaction is good for us, we learn by evolution, and evolution is a form of backpropagation. If there's errors in this, you die and you don't learn. So here's just showing you what the protein is. Proteins are really miraculous things. They really make life, uh, they're a material that make life simply possible. Proteins are a long chain of 20 different amino acids, like a necklace of 20 different colored stones. But that chain folds up, and you can see that the unfolded chain is much, much bigger than the folded chain. And the folded chain, in this case, a small protein with only 56 amino acids, the folded chain has a very precise three-dimensional structure. This is a protein that is an inhibitor of the enzyme trypsin. It exists in all of us. It also exists in almost all mammals. So basically, this shape has a very specific function. Here I'm just showing the same protein in two different views, showing you the colored beads, and then showing you that each amino acid, each vertex is an atom, also has a very precise shape. So protein folding is like making a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Okay, now one really important thing to remind you about proteins is that this process of folding up is completely spontaneous. It's, it's interesting, but I guess kind of also obvious, that life has to be self-assembling. We're used to everything that we know about being assembled from the outside. But in life, there was no outside. It had to be built up from first principles. And this is something which I think in the future, manufacturing will have to learn from. Biology is full of really, really good lessons. So now just moving forward to multi-scale modeling of macromolecules. This is an area that uh, I have been working in now for more than 50 years. I started doing independent research in 1967. And uh, this research was actually recognized uh, by the Nobel Foundation. Uh, the person who really got everything started is, was an Israeli scientist, Schneo Lifsen. Ariel Varshal was Schneo Lifsen's student. And I came to Israel in 1967 to be a programmer for Lifsen and Varshal. Martin Karplis visited uh, Israel afterwards, was very enamored by the idea. Aria did a postdoc with Martin Karplis. Uh, so I guess it's a very sad that Schneider Lipson passed away before the prize in 2013. But it would have been very difficult to decide. Nobel Prizes are only for three people. It would have been very hard to decide who was left out. So everything is fine. And basically, one thing that we did very early on in 1975 was a paper on simulating protein folding. Essentially, we were able to take a protein chain and simplify it to be a chain of beads, like you imagine it to be. But the important thing being the chain property. And then using energy minimization and something we call normal mode uh, thermalization, we could take the long chain and get it to spontaneously fold up. Now, this whole thing took about 20 minutes of computer time on a computer circa 1975. Uh, quite quick. It wasn't very accurate. This structure is folded, but it's not exactly the right answer. It's uh, probably today you would say it's, it has a GDT score maybe of 10 or 15. It's still similar, but not really that close, an RMS deviation of five angstroms. Uh, but the important thing was the concept. And it's also really important to realize 
that since then, computers have increased in speed by something like 10 to the 9, 1,000 times 1,000 times 1,000. This has made a lot of things possible. People often think that uh, AI is possible because of new discoveries and algorithms. That's partially the case. But the main thing that has made computers so prevalent in our lives is the speed of computing, which has just increased in an incredible way. OK, so now I want to tell you about uh, three projects uh, that relate more modernly, jumping forward in time from 1975 to the present. One is a project that has been done uh, by colleagues of mine at, at Baylor uh, called Opus X. And this is a project trying to predict accurate torsion angles uh, in using neural networks. Uh, like neural network models, there are almost always many boxes that are connected together by, by networks. And this is able, uh, again, using many different features taken together to get a structure which looks quite good. This is done by a small team. Uh, here's a movie showing their result. The correct answer is the blue structure. And this structure starts out very disordered and then folds up. So that is an example of protein folding. It's a large protein. And my guess is this is a selected good case. This doesn't always work like this. Um, but in some ways, um, this is a group that's been working. Uh, the chief person on this is uh, uh, Ma Peng. He's been working in this field for 30 years. I've known him for a very, very long time. Um, another discovery, which is much more in the news, is that DeepMind, which is a wholly owned subsidiary, actually not of Google, but of Alphabet, the parent company that also owns Google, uh, has been doing a lot of alpha things, alpha chess, alpha go. And then they decided to apply their machine learning experience to folding proteins. And I think for them, uh, they had a very large team. Uh, they do have some people on the team who actually know about proteins. But generally, it's been an effort in uh, getting into a new field without a lot of domain expertise. And uh, you know, they did really, really well. Uh, this is their score of 240. This is the second best score, which is almost exactly the same as the third best score. This is their team. This is a team led by David Baker. And this is a team led by three people, uh, Jung, et cetera, at the University of Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor. And then the others pale off. And these are, so they did very, very well. Uh, but again, it's important to realize that this is a blind competition. A sequence is released, and the group has three or four weeks to predict a structure. But not just one straight sequence. In this period, maybe 40 or 50 sequences are released. And this is a competition a little bit like the Olympic Games. Scale matters. If you have many athletes, you'll get more medals than if you have fewer athletes. So maybe the score needs to be uh, somewhat normalized. Uh, this shows um, the black line, how well DeepMind did. Uh, and you can see here, for the, these are targets that are easy. An easy target is a structure that is quite similar to a structure in sequence, to a structure that's already known. So DeepMind uh, does quite well well, maybe better than others, but not necessarily the very best on the easy targets. But when you come to the very difficult targets, where you don't have a lot of structure, they do very well. So for this, this was the thing that really surprised me. But I think there are two surprising things here. One is that it's a group that doesn't have domain expertise, a lot of it. And it's important to realize that domain expertise is actually important, but their work had been preceded by 60 years of research in this field. Their models were interesting. Uh, they used convolution networks, recurrent networks, graph networks, where they actually connected together the learning units in the same way that atoms are close to each other in proteins. So they were adaptive. And then sort of an attention model. Again, this group knows AI very, very well. Um, they did something which I thought was interesting, and in some ways it's exactly the opposite of what I did back in 1975. They basically said there is a chain. But let's break the chain up into 
rigid pieces and treat the whole protein like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And the good thing about doing that is that you could treat this whole big piece as a single rigid unit. So you can break anything up into rigid units and then have something favoring connecting them. So basically, it did very, very well. Uh, but it's also very important to realize that like all science, it's very well based on previous work, but even more so. Because machine learning needs examples, and the more examples, the better. So they had hundreds of thousands of structures from crystallographers, NMR specialists, cryo-EM people to solve the structures. Then they needed, for each of their structures, they often had five or six hundred different sequences from different species. The idea being that these variations should tell you what are the positions that matter and what are the positions that don't matter. And, you know, a lot of previous work in terms of representations, but it's still a very important finding. Uh, so determining structures is very important, but in fact, it's almost like a game. I mean, playing Go is very important, but it's not really important for, uh, you know, well-being. What is really important is what you do with the protein structures. And one thing that we are all very concerned about is getting better pharmaceutical agents. Uh, these are small molecules which, given to us in a pill, can actually make us better. And human health is obviously a problem of central concern. Structural prediction, maybe not. So biomedicine is critical. So basically, I want to just mention uh, a, a company uh, run by uh, Alex Javorotskov, uh, and it's a startup company. And basically, like the work on Opus X, they have many boxes that they connect. Uh, and basically, these are connected together using AI. I like this picture because it shows these as if they're printed circuits. But basically, one thing I would say about uh, in silico medicine is that they use AI for target discovery, for chemistry, for virtual screening, for clinical trial outcome prediction, and my guess is for anything else. They are literally AI from A to Z. AI is very much the core of the company. Uh, so this is a, a very important thing to realize. And the idea is, is to use AI not for one component, but for the entire pipeline. Pharmaceutical chemistry, drug discovery, is a very wide project. It goes from protein structure, through chemistry, through screening, with toxicity, with uh, clinical trials, many, many components. And AI is actually particularly good at integrating input from many components. Normally, if you do something without AI, you try to filter out the inputs. For AI, the more the better. And this is definitely their philosophy. And they've basically, using this technique, they're trying very, very hard to speed up the traditional approaches where it takes hundreds of millions of dollars and many years to even get to the stage of elite optimization. They're trying to reduce their time dramatically. The millions become thousands. So it's a very dramatic change of a factor of 100 or so. And uh, with this, they've actually been really quite successful. This is the hard step. How do you find a target? And what they did, that I think is really interesting, is look at profiles of many people. But how do you segment the people? If you know what the disease is, you can say sick people or healthy people. They did something which I think is, is very clever. Old people generally have more wrong with them than young people. In the same way that old motor cars have more wrong with them than new motor cars. But the things that are wrong with an old person will be reflected in their profile, in their biome, in their uh, epi epi epigenetics, maybe not in their DNA, but in which proteins are expressed. So by looking comparatively at things that are different between young and old, you start to be able to identify diseases. So in fact, uh, in silico medicine has taken the, pro the pipeline even further. We now have end enabling as part of the thing. And very importantly, idiopathic fibrosis and kidney fibrosis, we're actually at a stage now of starting microdosing in humans. So I think this is the way to go, the idea being that by going from A to Z with AI, the whole process is speeded up. I mean, you know, a lot of companies are working on uh, lead optimization. You can, if you make lead optimization super good and then you get stuck further down, and my guess is that they're going to be able to apply their methods further down the stream as they can 
to really optimize the whole process. So I think it's an example of using computer, using the ability to combine data. Also, in some cases, uncertainty is a good thing. By combining a lot of data that's uncertain, AI is very good at coping with vast amount of data, uncertain techniques. By combining them with clever filtering, we can get certainty and options from uncertainty. The protein folding problem, that was a very difficult problem for 50 years, uh, drug design, are all being dealt with in this global, all-encompassing way, and I'm personally very, very optimistic. So I just wanted to thank you all for attention, and I think we have a great future to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you.